Today's episode of The Dad Chronicle is brought to you by the card game Totem. Totem is a unique card game that emphasizes sharing what you appreciate most about the people you're playing with. Think Cards Against Humanity, but with compliments. Deanna and I recently played this game with some good friends of ours and immediately recognized how amazing this game is for building relationships with those around you, as well as recognizing the positive impact that you have on others. Head over to teamtotem.com to learn more about the game yourself. And when you buy it, use code ALEX10 at checkout and get 10% off. Again, that's code ALEX10 when you purchase the game at teamtotem.com. Welcome back to the Dad Chronicle. I'm your host, Alex Albisu. This is episode 90. Now, before we get started, I want to say thank you to our latest patron, John. Thank you very much for supporting the Dad Chronicle. If you at home are listening to this and saying, you know what, I could donate a dollar a month. Sure. That sounds like a great way to support this show. Head over to thedadchronicle.com. There's a button there to take you to our patron site. Every dollar helps. So a uh, big thank you again to John for supporting the show. It goes a long way. On today's episode, I speak with Travis Crawford, also known as TV's Travis, out there on the internet. Now, if you've heard America's Next Top Podcaster Season 2, he was a contestant there. So uh, he has been a big member of the Tadpole community. I've gotten to know him over the past almost a year or so, ever since I was on season one of America's Next Top Podcaster, and he was a listener there. Um, it's been really great getting to know Travis, and he has a very unique situation as a father that I think you guys are really going to find interesting. But first, we talk about the power that podcasting has to bring him into a creative space. Uh, YouTube or Netflix, it's easy to just fall into that hole and just sit back and consume, which I enjoy doing. But there's times where, you know, when you do that every night for a month or two at a time and you just suddenly you have nothing really to show for it. We also talk about his very unique co-parenting situation. Three parents and one kid, he kind of turns into a de facto little mini adult. And finally, we talk about the lessons that he has learned from his own father and how he brings them into his own parenting style as a stepfather. You know, an authority figure is an authority figure, whether it's a biological parent or a teacher or whatever that is. And so I kind of just looked at it as, I'm going to lay out the rule and then he's got to follow the rule. And if he doesn't, Uh, You know, I'm not going to immediately jump to harsh punishments, but I'm going to lay the the foundation for when you're given a rule, when you're given a task, those are the things you do, you know, and and also try to treat him with respect. Here's my conversation with TV's Travis. Travis Crawford, welcome to the Dad Chronicle. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Good, good, man. Uh, So you and I have gotten to know each other a bit over, I would say, the past year or so. You were a a listener of America's Next Top Podcast for season one, and now here you are coming off the tail end of season two, and Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I've gotten to know you a bit, and and it's been an an honest pleasure. So thank you for being on the show. I do appreciate you being here. Well, it it has been a pleasure getting to know you as well, and uh, thank you for having me on. It's been uh, quite a year for me, um, in a good way, but a lot has happened. (laughs) Yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit about that on this show, too. Um, so so why don't we do this? First, you introduce yourself to this internet audience who may or may not know you. Sure. Uh, so I'm Travis Crawford, uh, a.k.a. TV's Travis. Um, I use that handle pretty much anywhere I'm on social media. Um, I do a podcast on movie reviews where, um, and I've, I've had you on a couple of times now, Alex, um, right. where we, we talk about a movie that somebody... I know hasn't seen before and I get to get their first reaction, kind of honest, honest reaction to it. You know, hopefully they like it. Sometimes they don't. Um, but that's a lot of fun. Uh, season two of America's next top podcaster was, uh, a great thing. I learned so much about podcasting and cause I just started my show this, uh, this year. In fact, March of this year was my first episode. So I got to learn a lot and try to just grow as a, as a content creator and get back into uh, a thing that I used to do when I was younger um, with cable access television um, that I kind of got away from. So getting to do this, uh, this creator thing again is a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, what are you thinking about, you know, cause you're on 
Uh, let me think. Uh, th- uh, yeah, like you're almost, I mean, you're coming on to almost a year of podcasting. So what's this experience been like for you? Honestly, it's been great. Um, yeah. It gives me uh, a focus and an outlet for um, a lot of creative stuff. I-, I found myself digging back into old projects that I had started and then sort of went away from and I'm, I'm coming back to um, because every week I've got to, you know, watch this movie and, and get, you know, talking points ready and get everybody scheduled to, to do the show. So it's, it's giving me these creative outlets where I'm not just sitting stagnant watching, you know, falling down the YouTube hole, um, which is super easy to do. Oh, and yeah. I did for quite a while. Yeah, I think um, anybody can get caught down that rabbit hole, hole for sure. I think that's the beauty about something like podcasting is that it is a great creative outlet and it's so easy to just like jump right into. Um, mm-hmm. You don't need a ton of expensive equipment to do it. You just kind of jump in. You have a voice. You have a message that you want to say. And that's really great. So I'm glad that you've uh, you, you've picked it up as as something um, as somewhat of an outlet yourself. So that's awesome. Really glad to hear yeah, that. and and it's helped. I mean, like I say, a lot of things have happened in the last year for me, both starting the podcasting and work related and home life related. That that having something like this where I could focus on that every week and have something, it, it kept me from kind of falling. You know, if something would go wrong, I wouldn't fall down that hole. If if I had a rough day at work or a rough day at home, I could use it as a way to kind of get around that or. or not even get around it, but just kind of work towards getting beyond it. Yeah. So, is there, um, um, do you typically, is, is that like your go to to just hop on YouTube and just veg out for a while instead of doing something a little bit more productive? Yeah. Uh, YouTube or Netflix, it's easy to just fall into that hole and just sit back and consume, which I enjoy doing. But there's times where, you know, when you do that every night for a month or two at a time and you just suddenly you have nothing really to show for it. But, um, maybe some trivia answers and that's about it. So right. it, it's good for, um, I think, I think it's good for everybody to have something they can do that is interactive, uh, whether it's creating something or playing some video games or getting out and doing something physical outside. Uh, you know, it's harder for me in the winter where I live, I live in Northern Michigan. So from about now until May it's cold and I don't like being cold. So I don't go outside a whole lot. Yeah. So having some things I can do indoors. You're living uh, in the worst place, not just because you're living in Michigan and and you and I always (laughs) give each other a hard time because we're 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 an Ohio State family over here and we always Mm -hmm. like to pick on each other because of that. But um, the fact that you live up that far north and you don't like the winter, what what keeps you up there? Honestly, my family's here and it's what I know. And, you know, I've moved away a couple of times. Uh, I lived in Orlando, Florida for a while. Granted, the times that I was moving away were not the best kind of economic times to try and move to a new city. So that made it a little bit tough. But it's funny, as much as I dislike winter, the summers here are just so wonderful that it kind of makes up for it a little bit. So a combination of my family being here and the the months where the weather is fine, mm-hmm. it's beautiful up here. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. That's awesome. But yeah. It's that nine months of winter that can get tough. It's brutal. I mean, we I live here in Virginia and it's uh, you know, it's swamp weather otherwise. Uh like in the in the summer it sucks. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the same question could be asked of me. Um so let let's talk about your family. Um tell us about your family situation. Sure. So uh, um it's changed in the last couple of months. So I was in a long term relationship um with a girl named Anna. Um, we became friends actually from a job that we both worked at and eventually it became a relationship. We were together for almost 10 years. We just recently split up, um, about two and a half months ago. Uh, in the meantime, she had had a son. Um, so when her and I got together and moved in together, um, you know, I became part-time dad. Well, a couple, about five and a half years ago, we moved out of our apartment we had an opportunity to get into a, a rental house, but um, we needed another roommate. So her son's father was actually our roommate. So that's where, you know, it's a it's an abnormal situation. They, her and um, Michael's dad, Jordan, they get along great. They get along much better now than they did when they were together. Oh, wow. So it worked okay. Um, they just realized sort of actually how 
Anna and I's relationship kind of ended. There wasn't any animosity. There wasn't like a big fight. We, her and I just realized that we weren't in the same place anymore and we weren't going in the same direction. So that's sort of what happened with them. Um, but they, and because of that, they have a healthy relationship with each other. That helps with Michael, um, who's now 13. Um, and it also made, it made things a little easier for me kind of coming in part way. Cause I had been around since, um, he was born, but you know, just as a friend for the first few years of his life. And, uh, so in a way that kind of helped, um, with the, the sort of being stepdad, yeah. he got really used to me being around and he got used to calling me his stepdad. Um, you know, we developed a decent relationship that's adversarial at times, like any parent child relationship can be, especially when it's, you know, a boy and a dad, yep. there's always going to be butting of heads. But I think overall it, it's been a good relationship and it's, in some ways it's been nice having his dad around at the, in the same house because we can kind of be consistent with rules and uh, if there are punishments as well as, you know, uh, praising, but sometimes it can be tough because he's got almost too many parents and he's an only child. So three parents and one kid, he kind of turns into a de facto little mini adult. Yeah. Yeah. So that uh, there's a lot to unpackage here. I, I had, <laughs> First, I had no idea he was. Uh, he, you had been in his life for that long. I had no idea his father was living with you guys. Um, there, there's so much. Uh, but first, before we dive into that, how are you handling the breakup at this point? Surprisingly better than I thought I would. Um, if you had asked me a week or two before the breakup how I would have dealt with it, I would have told you I'd have been a mess. Um, Funny enough, it happened right before America's Next Top Podcaster started. Like literally two days before that. Really? So I kind of got to use that a little bit in motivation to like really dive into the the podcasting, the competition and, and really put some time into it because I needed that that outlet even more than normal. So overall, I'm actually doing really well with it because I had a, I had a chance to not dwell on the negative parts of it, get to focus myself into something, but then at the same time, be able to reflect and talk to her. Um, we gave it like a week of sort of distance. And then we've talked a few times um, since then she'll stop by still. Cause funny enough, uh, like I said, his, uh, you know, Jordan was our roommate. Well, she moved out and Jordan and I are in the house. So it's, it's myself Michael and his dad living in the house now. Um, so, so uh, you, I'm sorry, you're living there still. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So All right. she, she left, um, or not left, but she moved out. Got and, it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I, I sort of live in a sitcom. In uh, a yeah. I mean, you, you said it, not me, brother. I mean, I think that's, uh, <laughs> everybody has their own unique way of handling things. I mean, that, that's um that shows your tenacity, man. I mean, but but how do you get along with with his dad, Jordan? You said, yeah, um, we get along great. Uh, okay. We're we're a lot more similar than we are different, which is telling that Anna has a type. But um, <laughs> do both? But, uh, does he also yeah. have a magnificent beard? Um, he has a beard. It's not as nice as mine, though. I will say. I mean, that. are you just saying that because it's you have your beard and then he has his and you just want to be um right. and maybe a little bit but no honestly it's not quite <laughs> nice. um he, no he and i get along great yeah. uh when when anna and i were together still yeah. um he and i sort of tag teamed things like grocery shopping and some of the stuff because it was just easier with the way work schedules worked out and and the fact that neither one of us dread going grocery shopping at like a busy supermarket like Anna would. So it was just like, oh, we'll take care of that. And so we get along fine. You know, we'll, uh, he was part of a D&D campaign that I was in for a while. Um, we have uh, a good kind of roommate relationship going on. That's great. And so, what is it like being a co-parent in this situation? You've got three of you guys now in, you know, all separated from each other, but practically living in the same house what is this like it's uh it's interesting 
Um, I would say like any situation, it has good days and bad days. Um, but I would say the good outweigh just because we all early on got on kind of the same page. Um, and Michael being, being the age he was when I was around, because when I, when Anna and I started to get together, he was still only three, four years old. So he got used to me being around, but then his dad also being around and from like eight until now we've all lived under the same roof. So it was a lot easier to have kind of the co-parenting thing going on where it wasn't, okay, you have the rules at dad's house and then you come over to mom's house and it's, it's all that there was, he couldn't, he couldn't double ask for things because right. it was the same house. He couldn't get away with that. Um, and everything was consistent. And that was a big thing for the three of us was to keep things consistent. So, so being no, in the same house helped that a lot. So there was like, I mean, I'm sure there were times where you guys disagreed on a way to handle something with him, right? Or oh, were sure. you guys oh, pretty yeah. civil about it? Was it easy? Yeah. I mean, we, of course, you're going to disagree. Nobody's going to agree 100% of the time. Um, as far as any kind of disagreements went, yeah, it was all civil. We wouldn't argue in front of uh, Michael. Um, if we had disputes over the way things go, we would try to uh, sit down and talk about it. Now, I personally would, you know, go out, like take the dog out for a walk and vent and, and rant and rave to myself uh, before I came back. And then I, by that point, I have cooled off if I was really upset about something and we could talk. But um, that's sort of my MO for a lot of things, like having, having a dog helps. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. There's some, somebody who can, you know, listen without chiming back or, or anything. Exactly. Um, Yep, he can get me away from the situation. He'll listen and not judge me, and yeah. uh, then I can come back it, come back to it with a, a level head. But um, you know, it really just became a, a thing of we need to get on the same page. It's going to be the best for Michael to do that. So as much as we can, uh, and it helped again with Jordan and I being very similar and having kind of a similar mindset. Um, that helped a lot because there wasn't like a, you know, I'm vastly different from him. So I'm going to think about raising kids differently. Yeah. Um, so that helped a lot too, you know, and plus yeah. where he was, it was his first time being a dad, my first time being a stepdad, neither one of us knew what the hell we were doing. So just make it up as we go. Yeah. That this is so unique. Like my mind is going a million miles an hour <laughs> at this, just the, the situation that you're in um, and also the fact that you're just in a great relationship with all the all the people here. There's little contention at this point. I'm, I'm sure hearts are broken and that's hard, but that's not impossible to heal. And hearing how uh, Anna and her ex are, you know, together, they're very civil. Uh, I certainly hope that that remains the same for you guys. Uh, are you guys civil at this point? Or are you guys still working through it? Oh, no, we're definitely civil. I mean, That's she'll great. stop by and, and hang out with Michael here at the house or come have dinner. Um, I, For me, I mean, life is too short to hold grudges. Like, you have to really, really wrong me for me to hold a grudge. Had there been, I mean, obviously there are situations that could have caused the the end of the relationship that would be a lot more difficult. But it was one of those things where our relationship was, I wouldn't say it was like the writing was on the wall, but we had sort of drifted apart a little bit for a few months ahead of that. And so while it was still a, a bit of a shock for it to happen, it wasn't like it just came out of nowhere. Um, and there wasn't, you know, nobody cheated on anybody. There was no, uh, nobody was abusive. Right. So it was a lot easier to be civil and, you know, in the end, I just don't hold grudges. I, I'm just not good at it. So yeah. I'm able to move on and be, you know, be cordial with people a lot easier. That's great. So let's let's back up. You know, what is it? Ten years you you first met and I was um, and, and then you said you didn't start really dating or getting together until uh, Michael was about four so mm -hmm. were you apprehensive to jump into a relationship with somebody who had a kid? Definitely, because I had no clue what to do. I mean, my only frame of reference at all was my own dad, which, hey, he was great. My dad was wonderful, but that was the only frame of reference I had. I had no idea how to deal with kids. Um, 
you know, I, I didn't have a lot of young cousins or my, you know, my only sibling is two and a half years younger than me. So I was, all, I was already in my middle to late twenties. I think I was older than my dad was when he had me by the time I, you know, became kind of part-time dad to Michael. Wow. So mm. I was apprehensive. Sure. Um, but at the same time, you know, she was a big part of my life and she meant a lot to me and he was a good kid. So, you know, I had, I had been around him, not a ton, but I had been around, um, him a bit for the first couple of years of his life anyway. Right. So it made it a little bit easier of a transition, but I was still scared as hell. Yeah. Like I just didn't know. I didn't had, I did get lucky though. I got to dodge the diaper stage. So. <laughs> Oh, brother, dude, that is a <laughs> ruthless stage. Sometimes Aria will have like, you know, loaded her diaper right before we go in to, to you know, get her out of bed. Uh, mm -hmm. And you walk in and, you know, door's been closed. It's just like, oh, it smells so bad in here. When they start to learn how to use the potty, it's so much easier, man. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so let's talk about how you've built a relationship with Michael. This has been what you said about uh, ten years in the making. Um, yep. What were those first steps that you took to kind of get to know him, build trust, and all that? I, early on, because he was still pretty young, um, the best thing that I could do, and, and Anna had given me the same advice, was try to be like a friend to him because she was going to be mom and he was still kind of going back and forth between her and Jordan's. They weren't living together at the time. So he had dad and he had mom and the best, her best advice to me. And it, I think it worked fairly well was just be kind of like a, a friend to him, you know, hang out with him a little bit, play with some toys with him. Um, and then gradually kind of work into the sort of dad role and the discipline and, enforcing more rules like a little bit all, at all the time um and i think that helped a lot because he didn't look at me as an adversary right away that's great that's great advice too for dads or, or really any parent out there partner in this situation uh that's a great way to approach i would certainly uh, i would certainly agree that's a I, I think that when you have an opportunity to build trust with a child there's nothing worse than going in full bore disciplinary and like that's that's terrible. Uh, how, so when you did have to go into that mode, though, I mean, I'm sure you have. Mm -hmm. Do you do you feel like you would approach it differently as somebody that is not his biological father, or did that make a difference? Um, I didn't because I think that when it comes down to it, you know, an authority figure is an authority figure, whether it's a biological parent or a teacher or whatever that is. And so I kind of just looked at it as I'm going to lay out the rule and then he's got to follow the rule. And if he doesn't, uh, you know, I'm not going to immediately jump to harsh punishments, but I'm going to lay the, the foundation for, you know, when you're given a rule, when you're given a task, those are the things you do, you know, and, and also try to treat him with respect, even at a young age to show that you, you earn that respect and things are going to go better. I mean, the more, the more he and I can have respectful back and forth, even when he's, you know, seven or eight years old, which can happen. Um, it makes things go smoother. Uh, we're always going to butt heads and there's definitely times where, uh, we don't see eye to eye and, you know, I, I, the, you get that flash in your head of like Homer Simpson choking Bart, but you yeah. just got to push that down and, and just be like, no, no, I can, I can deal with this. I can be calm and rational and again, take the dog out for a walk. Uh, right. Yeah. But, um, no, I, I wouldn't change how I approach things. I don't think, I think that as far as father son relationships go, um, and given the unique situation that it was, I think it, it, we built a pretty good one. That's really great to hear. And in these conversations that I have with a lot of dads around this topic, a lot of their own father has uh, influenced the way that they parent. So why don't we talk a little bit about your dad? So can you sure. give us a rundown about uh, Papa TV Travis, TV Travis Sr.? Yeah, so... Um, Think of me, but older. It really, I mean, it's not, <laughs> it, it, it's really that. He, my dad very rarely got 
uh, visibly angry. He was a very calm person. Um, he and I shared a lot of, uh, a lot of things because he, you know, I grew up, um, he was still playing, uh, baseball after high school and then through like his mid twenties. Uh, and then he transitioned to playing, um, slow pitch, softball, basketball. And because of that, that's what I grew up around. So he and I bonded over, uh, sports a lot. That was our thing. We could sit down and watch the Detroit Tigers or the Detroit Lions. We'd go out in the driveway and play basketball together. You know, it was a big thing for me the first time I beat him playing one-on-one. Um, but he was always, he was always uh, stern, but never overly strict, I guess. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's hard to describe. He was kind of one of those that um, I knew him as just being my dad. And then I'd have friends of mine that would be intimidated by him because I'm a tall guy. I'm about, I'm pushing six foot four. My dad is close to that, about six, two, six, three. And he kind of has a permanent scowl. Plus he's always had sort of the Tom Selleck mustache. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I had friends of mine when I was in middle school and in high school that were a little intimidated by him because he's not a talkative person. Sure. Um, until you get to know him. And I'm like, you're intimidated by him. He's a teddy bear. Like uh, I can make yeah. fun of him. You know, I, he and I, I could make fun of him when he started losing his hair. You know, I'd, I'd make fun of, I'd make bald jokes and all that. And he'd take it, you know, good naturedly like, yeah. oh, you'll get yours. Don't worry. But um, yeah, we had a great, we, and we still do have a great relationship. So, yeah. And I was about uh, to ask, I heard you using the past tense a lot. I wasn't sure. So he's still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what sort of relationship does he have with, uh, with Michael? Um, a decent relationship. Michael and him, you know, my dad's into a lot more sports than Michael is. That's just not his thing. We, you know, we explored that. I tried taking him with me to things like uh, open gym uh, playing basketball, and he just kind of grew to a point where he wasn't into that. But he gets along with my dad just fine. Um, is I it would mean- say, would you say that it's how meaningful is it for you? to have a relationship between your dad and, and Michael, is that something that is important to you? Um, to an extent, although my sister has uh, a son and he spends a lot more time with my dad. So, um, you know, it's hard to say, I think in a way, yes, but because of like just the way kind of schedules and having multiple families to deal with, uh, because, you know, when, when Ann and I were together, like Christmas was at three different houses, right? Because we had Jordan's family, we had her family, and we had my family. Uh, yeah. So it was it was split a little bit more than you would normally get. Yeah. And um, so I would say, yeah, it is it, it is somewhat important, but not quite as important maybe as if if Michael was biological child. Sure. And and that I don't, it's hard to describe. But. No, I understand. Yeah, and, and you're totally uh open to you know however you want that relationship to be right like i think that's really important to recognize that and that's that's mm-hmm. really good to hear um I, I always am curious the perspective of a stepfather in these situations is there sort of a, a lasting impact or or some kind of a memory that you always want Michael to take into consideration if he thinks of you? I hope that he thinks that I was consistent in the way that I was, I approached being a stepdad. Um, He won't always think that I was fair and I get that. I know when I was a kid, I didn't always think my parents were fair but I hope that I came across as consistent. In other words, I, I didn't want to treat, uh, you know, chores one way and then the next week, oh no, you don't have to worry about those. And I just wanted to consistently kind of give the same baseline um, and and get some of that kind of, um, get that into his life. Cause I think that's important. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. So not, you know, as somebody who grew up with two parents, married still to this day, um, I know that in talking to a lot of folks who have been raised in homes that have split, it can cause a lot of, um, you know, heartache and uh, depending on how people handle those situations. And I mean, all things considered, it, it really sounds like you guys 
have hit a jackpot from a relationship perspective. The fact that he he has consistency across the board with all three of you, um, being able to live in the same house uh, with that level of love and commitment to him as a child, that is something to remember. So so kudos to you, man. That is amazing. Well, thanks. Um, what sort of advice would you give stepdads out there who may be having trouble getting to know, um, you know, their, their child, whether they're jumping into the relationship now or they're a few years in and they're just, something is just not clicking. Like, what would you say to them? I mean, I, you know, I was unique and uniquely lucky in that I was able to have a good relationship with his biological father. Um, and that could then extend to making things a lot easier to get to know him and to, cons- you know, keep that consistency going. If that is a possibility, I always recommend to people to, to do that. Um, cause that was the big thing that helped me out. But, you know, the biggest thing is get to know the kid. Um, what do they enjoy? What do they not like? How do they react to situations? So if, if they react to things where they get very uh, confrontational right off the bat, then, you know, you, you got to read and react a lot as a parent uh, is what I found. Um, when I was a kid, it, it's cliche, but, you know, when you're a kid, you think your parents know everything. Yeah. Um, and then you find out that they had no clue at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had to tell Michael a few times in the last year as he's finally gotten kind of old enough to, to understand it a little bit better. Is like, there's no manual for this. Um, we're, you know, as parents, you do the best that you can, but it definitely helps to talk, talk to the child and get to know them uh, as well as you can. And that's going to help make interactions with them go better. The more you can know them and how they can react to things, the better because then you know how not to overreact or how right. how to react. Yeah. God, yeah, that's it's a recurring theme in this show. You know, this is this will be I think it's episode 90. I got to go look back, but after 90ish episodes of this show, it's so simple. Communication, whether it's with your spouse, your partner, whoever, with the child, having a good open dialogue like really solves about 90% of the problems that could occur in whatever uh, variation of the relationship that you have with whoever Absolutely. It is. Absolutely. Because it can stop problems before they arise. Yeah. Right. If you're openly communicating with somebody and, and you have a good dialogue and you can understand each other, then you can head off an issue before it becomes an issue and it doesn't have a chance to sit and fester. And that's tough. That's so hard to do, man, because it really for is. A lot of people, and I am guilty of this. Uh, I have a, a bit of pride and I don't want to admit I was wrong. And, you know, Deanna's the same way. She's stubborn. And that's just, that's, that's stuff that you have to give up. You have to not, yeah, you, you have to get over that, you know? And, and, and I do think that that's something that I, I'm not sure why, because I'm a competitive person. I don't want to be wrong any more than anyone else does, but somewhere along the line when I was, probably just out of high school even, I kind of realized that I'm not always right. And in fact, I'm often wrong, but also that I can admit to that. And it's not a huge, it it doesn't detract from me as a person. And I think whenever I had that uh, epiphany or I evolved that thought over time, um, that helped a lot. It helped in all of my relationships, not just with Michael, but with uh, family members and and everything. I, I also, I mean, it, it really comes back to that kind of read, read and react. Uh, that's going to help all your interpersonal relationships. If you kind of know how to deal with certain people, because you're going to, there's going to come times where you have to tell somebody that they're wrong. Yeah. And if you can do that in a way that can get the point across without inciting, uh, hostility, then it's going to go better. Yep. And, and I, I'm, personally a believer in compassion and empathy uh in in those situations uh, above all else and being willing to hear them and recognizing their point of view uh that has always worked really well for for me um when having to kind of confront anybody really uh about something a coaching situation uh i do a lot of coaching and mentorship and when i am 
hearing what somebody's saying, the worst thing that you can do is just you know dismiss their perspective. You have to listen um, and, and, oh, absolutely. and acknowledge where they're uh, coming from. Yeah, I mean, most of the time when people uh, that I at least I have noticed most of the time uh, when you when you start to get animosity going, it's people are searching for validation of some kind. And if you can show that and show that it, that respect that I'm going to respect you and listen to you. And then we can have a dialogue where it's not just I'm right, you're wrong, or I'm going to put the wedge in between us to start off. Mm -hmm that you can just get a lot further in, in everything. You, I don't have to agree with everything that everybody says, but I can I can show them respect enough to have the conversation. Yeah. Very well said. Very well, well said. I, I love that. Okay. Um, why don't we take a moment to uh, reflect on some of your accomplishments this year, like all the changes uh, that you've had. So you have, uh, you, you've gotten... Uh, you've gotten some some good kudos at work. Is that what you were saying earlier? Yeah. So um, I started. It was about a a little over a year ago. Um, I had an opportunity to change jobs. Mm -hmm. um, I was still. I, I was working. I went to school for kind of systems administration and IT. Um, and I was working, doing a little bit of that, but also it was retail sales. Mm -hmm. And an opportunity came along to, to keep working in the technology end of things, but get out of the retail world. So that was a big change for me. It was a, an actual career job as opposed to, you know, just a job to get by. Yeah. Um, and since I started there, um, things have kind of progressed a little bit. And now I'm, I'm working kind of up the ladder a little more, um, taking on some more responsibilities. So that was a big change of just more, not necessarily more time, a little bit more time, but a lot more responsibility at work and a lot more things that I had to keep track of. Um, so that was a big change. Uh, now we're moving, cha moving our office. I'm doing a little more traveling for work to kind of keep that going so is the travel good um, from a family perspective it works fairly well um it, it helped a lot when um anna was still here because there was uh, there's always somebody in the house so uh but i mean even even with her not living in the house anymore it's it still um it works okay and it gives me a chance to um you know get out for a week and just sort of decompress and kind of get away from yeah. the situation. I think that's healthy I agree. to, to be able to kind of extricate yourself and have a little decompression time by yourself, um, away from whatever family, whether it's parents, siblings, significant other. Um, I, I'm a big proponent of like, when you're in a relationship, you want to do a lot of things together, but you still need to have those things you do that are just for you. Yep. Um, so the work trips kind of helped that out a little bit. Yeah. Unless uh, there was the ones to Iowa because those were just boring. Oh, well, that's Iowa. I mean, no, no <laughs> offense to listeners in Iowa, but. Right. I, I mean, no offense to anybody from Iowa, but yeah. man, there was nothing there. <laughs> you got like what? No, Idaho is potatoes. What do you got in Iowa? Uh, corn. A lot of corn. corn. Yeah. Um, well, well, good for you. And, and also on top of that. You had a, a great uh, time on America's Next Top Podcaster. Um, so so how important was it for you to, to be on that show? Was that a really big deal for you? That was uh, a big thing for me. You know, I had, I had listened to the first season, um, and I just – I loved the idea of doing, you know, the, the challenges and all of that. And then I got to know you and another contestant, Gidget, uh, chatting with both of you. And it was actually, you were the one uh, that gave me like the, the kind of nudge where I was like, ah, maybe I'll, you know, they're taking submissions and you were like, go for it. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. And I, and then I was like, you're right. What is the worst that can happen? I don't get on. All right. So I put in the thing. What was funny is there was 12 contestants for season two. I was like number 13 or 14. We, there was somebody that dropped, that had to drop out. And so I was an alternate and I came in. So I wasn't even originally going to be on. So for me, it was like, okay, every, every challenge I make it through is just, I'm playing with house money. So I'm, I'm going to go for it. Like, yeah, man. I went into this thinking I got as good a chance as any to, to win this thing, but I'm, I'm going to learn whatever I can and sponge up so much while yeah. I'm here. Because you look at, I mean, 
the hosts and the judges are people that I have watched and listened to for years and really respect in the field of, of content creation. So to learn from them and interact with them was, it, it's just great. Yeah. What was it like kind of interacting with them? I, Cause so just some background uh, for people who listen, if you go to America's next top podcaster.com, you can hear um, the, the competition. Uh, I was on season one, as I've talked about on the show a few times, uh, but uh, Travis here was on season two. And uh, if you go back and listen, you can hear, I did it. I always do all the exit interviews for this season. And uh, I had the pleasure of giving um or speaking with travis about his experience but i don't know if i asked you this question what was it like working on a you know almost semi-daily basis with people like scott johnson and brian Ibbett and justin robert young and like all these people that i'm sure you've listened to for years yeah it was um a little surreal just because when you spend enough time like and justin probably more so than anyone else, just because he was the the one that I've listened to the longest. Um, and, but even, but I would say in terms of number of hours listened to, because Scott puts out stuff every day, oh, yeah. it's pretty close at this point. And so it was a little surreal at first, but at the same time, you listen to somebody do the types of shows that they do. And especially for the amount of time that they've been doing it and the style you kind of feel like you get to know them at least a little bit. Yeah. So that helped. And at the end of the day, it's the cliche of, you know, they're just normal people. Yep. Um, but it was just really cool. And it was, it was a lot of fun and, uh, and really interesting to hear their insights because, you know, they don't, they don't know anything that goes on behind the scenes until, uh, unless we tell them after the fact. Right. So to hear kind of raw reactions to something, and then kind of getting to sort of give a little bit of an explanation and maybe hear either a change in reaction or, uh, you know, a, more of a realization, but also just to, to be able to produce something and have somebody that you respect and really uh, honor their, their thoughts on the kind of thing that you're trying to do. Right hear it and get to say you know look this was good you had you did a good job with this or hey i like the approach that you're taking but here's how you can do it better mm -hmm. and for me that was a big thing because i'm always looking to get better at what i do love it so love you it. know yeah everybody go listen to america's next Top podcaster i think uh, this it wasn't intended to turn into like a little plug segment <laughs> but you know what? We were both on the show. Why not? Let's give it some love. I think that's fine. Hey, and I'll tell you what, uh, the 12 people that were on with, with me this season, every single one of them is worth going to listen to. Oh yeah. They're just great people. And everybody from season one too. I've, I've had you, um, on my show. I've had Monica from season one on my show and uh Gidget as well. Um, yeah. and everybody, I mean, it's just, it's great. Uh, a great group of people. Good community. Just genuinely man. nice yeah. people. It's a great community. Yeah. Yeah, it's so funny how how like all, like everybody in these shows has become like an integral part of my life, like my daily uh, content creation experience and, and career, if you will. So it's mm -hmm. uh, it's super fun to have everybody on each other's shows and kind of hearing all these different perspectives. So it's super fun. And, and speaking of content creation, why don't you take a moment and let people know where they can reach you? So um, I gave my podcast a horrible name, uh, which was Wait You Haven't Seen with ellipses and a question mark. And it, it just wasn't a well thought out idea. Uh, that's what I get for being a first time podcaster. But that's all right. I, I did secure TVstravis.com. And that's there easy to go. find. Uh, and since it's the same name that I use everywhere, um, that's the place to go to find not only my show, but, uh, you know, Twitter runs through there. Um, Pretty much any social media platform. If you look for TVs, Travis, you'll find me. Um, and if it's if if it's not using the the same picture or a variation of it, it's probably somebody trying to trying to hone, hone in on my action. So, yeah, how, um, how dare they? Stay away I from know. Travis and his, um, his copyright But yeah, I, the website is the perfect place to do it. I put a show out every week. Um, I have managed to since I started in March um, miss one week only so far. Wow, good for you, man. Oh, yeah, and that was my own fault because I uh, 
hit a button on my mixing board and recorded something horribly wrong and I just couldn't put it oh, out. No. I couldn't bring myself to do it. Oh, what a bummer. Well, it happens to all of us. It's yeah. fine. It's fine. I've had I've had even worse happen, you know. Knock on wood, nothing else happens. Right. Um the only thing I'm going to leave you on uh, before we end the show is that Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. Okay. <laughs> we'll agree to disagree on that. <laughs> Again, our guest has been uh, Travis Crawford, also known as TV's Travis. Thanks for being on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you again to our guest, TV's Travis. If you head over to tvstravis.com, you can hear the show that we were talking about. Um, I've been on a show a couple times. It's a lot of fun talking about movies that we've never seen. I have uh, my, my co-host Diddy from Joystick and Mouse has been on his show as well, talking about how he's never seen The Princess Bride. I know. I know. I sat down and I watched it with him. It's fine, everybody. Diddy has seen The Princess Bride at this point. It's fine. But anyway, go, go head over to tvtravis.com and give that a listen. So thank you again, Travis, for being on the show and sharing your story. If you enjoyed what you listened to today, give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. That definitely helps. And also consider supporting the show. If you head over to thedadchronicle.com, there's a link there to become a patron. And special thanks again to our latest patron, that's John. It was really, really nice of him to support this show, and you can support it as well. Even $1 a month goes a long way to the production costs. So again, that's thedadchronicle.com. There's a link there to our patron site where you can check out the various rewards. And if you'd like to chime in on the conversation we just had, you can email thedadchroniclepodcast at gmail.com. And if you'd like to follow me on social media, that's at Alex Albisu. My last name is spelled A-L-B as in boy, I-S as in Sam, U. Thanks for listening. See you next time. If you like this show, check out more great content at incastmedianetwork.com.